China is one of the world's most fascinating and complicated countries. And its cities seem to get bigger every year. Considered a rural society just a few decades ago, China today is home to the world's largest urban population. I traveled to China independently for more than a decade on several occasions. And in this video, I will show you some of the most striking and interesting cities I came across. From the ancient centers of Beijing and Xi'an to the modern megacities of Shenzhen and Guangzhou. We visit the freezing winter festivals of Harbin and the popular summer holiday beaches of coastal Qingdao. From the streets of fusion cities like Hong Kong and Macau, we travel to Tibetan Lhasa, located on the rooftop of the world. We also take a look at the now historic alleys of Kashgar in the controversial Xinjiang region. And the empty streets of Ordos, China's best known ghost town. And we explore the expanding urban centers along the Yangtze River, all the way to the fast-paced metropolis of Shanghai. So join me on this journey through urban China. We begin our travels in Shanghai, one of China's most unique and dynamic cities. Its iconic skyline has become a symbol of the country's explosive economic growth of the past decades and provides a glimpse into the many changes China has undergone. While it's a lot of glitz, glamour and commerce here, Shanghai also has some beautiful historic architecture, peaceful parks and laid-back neighborhoods. Most travelers start their trip to the city on the Bund, a waterfront promenade lined with former Western consulates and financial institutions. Many of these buildings are now used as restaurants, bars and fashion stores. And are a stunning contrast with the modern skyline of Pudong, Shanghai's business district. Mostly farmland only three decades ago, this spectacle of skyscrapers has become a major financial hub. Some of the buildings have observation decks from where you can get amazing views over the city. For those interested in China's economic story, it may be worthwhile to hire a taxi to the city's deep water port, the largest container terminal in the world. Shanghai is a city of commerce, which is best seen by walking Nanjing Lu, a pedestrian-only shopping street in the heart of the city. If the crowds become overwhelming, the nearby Ying'an Temple might bring some relief. 
where you can join a Buddhist ceremony or simply escape the hustle and bustle from the streets. More traditional neighborhoods still exist, but you have to look closely these days to find them. Walking some of the narrow alleyways of this old Shanghai is an adventure on its own. And it's easy to get lost, both in time and place. This authentic Shanghai, however, is disappearing fast as many buildings are taken down and replaced by apartment towers and shopping malls. Whatever you think of it, this is the story of Shanghai, a city in constant flux, changing all the time. And who dares to guess what it will look like in a few decades? After Shanghai, we travel all the way to the north of China to visit Harbin, a city of over 5 million people with a strong historic Russian influence. While it's a good place to visit all year, things really get busy in winter, when millions of people come to see the famous Ice and Snow Festival. Thousands of workers prepare for many weeks in bitterly cold conditions. Building temples, sculptures and palaces, all made from ice and snow. Watching them at work may be as impressive as the festival itself. Other than admiring the craftsmanship and artwork, visitors can also take part in many winter activities. And as you walk around the festival grounds, you will see people sledding, skating and using ice bicycles. While spectacular during the day, my favorite time to visit the festival was around sunset. At twilight, the ice sculptures are lit up with beautiful neon lights, creating a magical atmosphere. Temperatures also drop dramatically, so be sure to wear enough layers. We travel onwards to Beijing, the nation's capital. Beijing has a history that goes back more than 3,000 years. It's the political center of China, but also brims with culture and creativity. A good place to start exploring the city is Tiananmen Square, where Mao Zedong proclaimed the People's Republic of China in 1949. 
an event that changed the course of the country drastically. Since then, Tiananmen has been used for celebrations and parades, but was also the epicenter of a suppressed student protest in 1989. These days, the square is a hotspot for Chinese tourists and gets especially busy on national holidays. Across from Tiananmen lies the Forbidden City one of the most interesting historical sites in Beijing. Off limits for 500 years, hence its name, this is the largest and best preserved cluster of ancient buildings in China. Two dynasties of emperors lived here, who only left the walled city when they really had to. Other landmarks in Beijing include the Summer Palace and the Temple of Heaven Park, a beautiful complex of religious buildings in the south of the city. Watching some of the daily life in the parks and some of the remaining hutongs, narrow alleyways in traditional neighborhoods, is one of the best things you can do in Beijing. You might come across people playing Jiangzi best described as a mix of badminton and football, or mahjong, the classic Chinese tile game. Don't leave the city without tasting, or at least smelling, Peking duck, a dish first served to emperors, and watching a show of Beijing opera. Beijing also has a modern face, which you will meet as you travel through the city. Head to Wang Fujing to get a sense of the commercial face of Beijing. Or take a look at the impressive stadiums inside the 2008 Olympic Spark. And must do when in Beijing is visit the Great Wall, a series of fortifications that were built along the borders of ancient Chinese states and later Imperial China. These stretches were linked when China was unified in the Qing Dynasty more than 2000 years ago and became known as the Great Wall of China. Now, the people you see climbing the wall here can actually not watch this video. Their internet access is restricted by the Chinese government, something that is often referred to as the Great Firewall of China. Many foreign websites and apps are blocked, including Facebook, Instagram, Google, and also YouTube. Aside from the impact on Chinese society, this can also be very inconvenient for travelers, something I experienced firsthand. Gladly, there is a service called VPN, meaning virtual private network, that lets you access these sites safely. Which brings me to the sponsor for this video, Surfshark. With a Surfshark VPN, you can connect to all your favorite sites, no matter where you are in the world. Simply open the app, select one of the many servers, and start watching or reading your favorite content. I always turn on VPN when using public Wi-Fi, also outside China, to make sure my passwords and personal details are secure. All information sent over Surfshark is encrypted, protecting you from the many digital hazards we face today. 
With a VPN you're virtually placing your device in a different country, which can also come in handy if you want to watch Netflix or other shows that are region specific. If all this sounds interesting then Surfshark has a great offer for you, with 3 months extra for free and 83% off. Simply scan the QR code or click the link in the description and use my promo code, OFFER. And good to know it has a 30 day money back, guarantee. Now let's continue our journey through urban China. By some accounts, the largest municipality in China. Chongqing is a mind-boggling place and our next destination. Located on the mighty Yangtze River, it has become an important commercial and transportation hub, attracting people from around the region and beyond to work and live. Traveler's first impression of Chongqing can be overwhelming, as the city is built on steep mountains and hills, making it challenging to navigate. Gladly, a cable car spanning the Yangtze and a light railway line meandering through the tall skyscrapers make it easier to get around. Nevertheless, visitors should be prepared to climb a lot of stairs. Chongqing lacks the attractions that other cities have, but it's a fascinating place to witness some of the urbanization process that takes place across the country. While China used to be a country of farmers, it is quickly becoming a nation of city dwellers. In Chongqing you'll stumble on a contrasting image at almost every corner. Old neighborhoods need to make way for shopping malls, offices and residential apartment towers. Destroying one way of life, trying to create another. We continue our journey to Lhasa, the spiritual heartland of Tibet, located on the rooftop of the world. While there are other ways to reach Lhasa, I found the most interesting one by train, traveling on the highest railway line in the world, over 5000 meters at some stretches. Traversing the rugged, barren Tibetan landscapes proved a beautiful introduction to arriving in Lhasa, which felt like stepping into a different world. The first views of the magnificent Potala Palace are truly unforgettable. This is the historical seat of the Tibetan government and former winter residence of the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people, who is currently living in exile in India. Tibet has had a tumultuous history dating back to the 7th century 
and has known periods of independence and occupation by Chinese and Mongolian dynasties. More recently, in 1950, it was invaded by communist China, which has ruled the region ever since. Much has been written about the Tibetan issue and it's a good idea to read up before you travel here. And note that foreign travelers can only visit Tibet as part of a group tour. A good way to start exploring Lhasa is by joining pilgrims making a traditional kora as they walk around the Potala Palace, turning prayer wheels and mumbling mantras. Kora is a combination of pilgrimage and meditative practice in Tibetan Buddhism. It's also possible to climb the Potala Palace, but make sure to take your time as Lhasa is located at an altitude of over 3,600 meters. Another spot not to miss is the Sera Monastery, one of the largest in Tibet and an important center of education. Come here for the daily debating session, when monks discuss philosophical and religious topics inside of their courtyards. My favorite area in Lhasa is called Barkor, essentially the spiritual center of the city. Countless pilgrims walk around the Yok Hang Temple they perform prostration, a ritual meant to purify negative thoughts and bad karma. Some prostrate all the way from their villages to Lhasa, a journey that can take several months, but most take part in shorter versions. After Lhasa, we travel to central China to visit Xi'an, one of the four ancient Chinese capitals. Located in a region that was at the heart of early Chinese civilization. Known as Chang'an in the older days, it was at the center of several dynasties and flourished as the beginning and end of the historic Silk Road. Before its demise in the 10th century, this was a place where Chinese culture and creativity thrived and many religions coexisted. While Xi'an today is mostly a modern city, reminders of its history are scattered in and around town. The city walls, although constructed in the 14th century, are a good example of how imperial cities were built. It's almost hard to imagine that the walls of ancient Chang'an originally enclosed an area seven times larger than this. One of my favorite spots in Xi'an is the Muslim neighborhood home to the city's Hui community for centuries. With 
although the area has undergone many changes and parts are now mostly geared towards tourism, it's still a good place to wander around, meet the people and try some of the delicious food. Siaan's most famous place, however, lies outside the city. The magnificent Terracotta Army is located around 40 kilometers east of downtown Siaan and is one of China's most impressive historic sites. The army, consisting of thousands of life-size warriors, horses, chariots and others, depicts the armies of Qin Shi Huang first emperor of a unified China. It was built underground around the tomb of the emperor more than two millennia ago. It was only discovered in 1974 by local farmers. We continue our travels to Ordos, a somewhat surreal city in the north of China. The purpose for coming here was to see one of the country's best known ghost towns. In the Chinese context, these are cities or neighborhoods that are newly constructed but where very few people actually live. The reason these ghost towns exist is simply put for the sake of economic growth. Many Chinese analysts would say they are investments into future urbanization, while global experts argue they are an example of a growing property bubble and housing crisis in the country. Walking through the largely deserted streets, past lavish but empty apartment buildings and through quiet shopping malls did feel somewhat eerie. And as I traveled to other parts of China, such as here in Shanfu. I couldn't help but wonder what these places would look like in a few decades. Our next destination lies in far western China, in the now controversial Xinjiang province. Kashgar is, or was, a city like no other. Surrounded by mountains and deserts, it is closer to Baghdad than Beijing. And its original inhabitants, the Uyghurs, are closely linked to the people of Central Asia. It was an important stop on the ancient Silk Road and has been at the crossroads of cultures and religions for over two millennia. Please note that I visited Kashgar in 2010 and many things have changed since then.
Before being demolished and rebuilt, Kashgar's old town was where most travelers went to get a sense of the traditions and customs of the Uyghur people. This was where craftsmen had been working for generations, creating beautiful silverware, clothes, handicrafts and other things. The narrow alleys in these remaining pockets of Old Town were filled with activities and charm. And I could spend hours, if not days, just soaking up the atmosphere. Sunday, traders from around Kashgar gathered at a massive livestock market, unrivaled in the region. Thousands of goats, cows, horses, donkeys and other animals invaded the town at sunrise. Accompanied by farmers, nomads and shepherds. It was a fascinating sight, it could easily be the set of a movie. These traditional scenes, however, were disappearing quickly after the Chinese government made Kashgar and the entire province of Xinjiang a so-called top priority. In recent years, things escalated further, with around a million, mostly Uyghur people, being detained in what the Chinese government calls re-education camps. This process has been condemned globally and the treatment of the Uyghurs in and out of these camps has been labeled a crime against humanity by the UN and other international organizations. We can only hope that the situation in this region will somehow improve in the future. After Kashgar, we travel back to eastern China to visit Qingdao, one of China's most beautiful coastal cities. Set on the shores of the Yellow Sea, with rolling green hills as backdrop, it surely is a scenic place. Many Chinese tourists come here to visit the beaches and eat some of the best seafood in the country. But it was the German architecture that caught my eye when I first arrived here. German naval officers invaded Qingdao in the late 19th century and left their mark on the city, building railway lines, churches, villas, schools and even a brewery. Tsingtao is now one of China's largest beer producers.
Perhaps the most striking building is St. Michael's Catholic Church. The church has a beautiful interior, but equally interesting is what often takes place on the outside. Soon to be married brides and grooms, wearing western style dresses, take orders from busy camera crews. The wedding industry is booming in China, with a rising middle class able to afford more extravagant festivities, including pre-wedding photo shoots. Like many cities in China, Qingdao is also changing rapidly and the contrasts become bigger as you move into the suburbs. Here you can see everything from disappearing neighborhoods and second-hand markets to wholesale companies and industrial centers. Qingdao's modern city center feels entirely different. It's only a short taxi or subway ride away from the old town. But I suggest using the waterfront promenade, where you can walk through some beautiful areas of the city. Follow the coastline all the way south to visit Hong Kong, seen by many as the perfect fusion between east and west, and one of my favorite cities in the world. It's a modern metropolis, but also a cultural powerhouse. It's easy to fall in love with Hong Kong at first sight, with its amazing skyline and backdrop of green mountains. But for many, this is only where the story begins. The city was part of Britain for almost a century. The result of negotiations with the Chinese Empire after the infamous Opium Wars. Over the years, with ups and downs, the people of Hong Kong managed to build a flourishing society with democratic freedoms and their own identity. Some of these freedoms, however, have come under pressure after the city was handed back to China in 1997. Recently, the city has seen massive protests, with people voicing their concern over China's growing influence.
One of the best ways to start exploring Hong Kong is to visit the spectacular Victoria Peak, from where you can admire the jaw-dropping urban landscape of the city. You can reach the peak by taxi or on a steep hike. Most travelers use the historic Victoria Peak Tram, a gravity-defying attraction that should not be missed. Another way to appreciate the city skyline is to sail the classic Star Ferry across Victoria Harbour. For just a few Hong Kong dollars, this is probably the best value trip in the city. Hong Kong is a breeze to get around and boasts a very efficient public transport system including an extensive metro network, double-deck trams and even helicopters for those who can afford it. For some travelers, Hong Kong is a shopper's paradise. And sometimes it feels like the city is one giant shopping mall, as many buildings are connected by air-conditioned walkways. Others come here for the Cantonese food, which is some of the best in Asia. From luxurious restaurants to street food markets and local eateries, there is something for everyone. For a different side of Hong Kong, head to some of the tranquil islands or visit the big Buddha statue, located in a major Buddhist center in the mountains. But it's the streets of Kowloon district and beyond that really make me love Hong Kong. This is the cultural heartland of the city where traditional neighborhoods mix with bustling street markets. It feels overwhelming in some parts, yet surprisingly peaceful in others. Visit one of the many temples, browse some of the markets, sample local cuisine, or simply wander around and be surprised by this magnificent city. A stone's throw away from Hong Kong lies Macau, a former Portuguese enclave that is known as the Las Vegas of the East. Its skyline is dominated by some of the world's largest casinos, and parts of the city have turned into massive entertainment centers. The reason for its popularity is simple. It's the only place in China where gambling is legal.
Macau also has a different face, with a Portuguese influence that is still visible today in its architecture, food and culture. Even though you'll share the street with a lot of tourists, it's a fun and interesting place to spend a day or two. Bordering Hong Kong on the north, Shenzhen is one of China's most remarkable cities and our next destination. A small fishing village merely 40 years ago, Shenzhen has grown into one of the country's largest and wealthiest cities. It attracts business people migrant workers and investors from around the country and the world, all chasing the Chinese economic dream. Shenzhen became a so-called special economic zone in 1980, an idea brought forward by Deng Xiaoping, who led a series of market economy reforms that propelled the growth of China. Since then, Shenzhen has become China's largest electronics manufacturing hub and is now a leading high-tech center. For travelers, Shenzhen may not offer a lot of sights. Yet there are plenty of parks, shopping centers, and a surprising theme park that can keep you busy. In general, I found Shenzhen a young and dynamic place, where you can get a sense of China's urbanization and economic expansion of the past decades.
around China in numerous ways, the high-speed railway network is by far the most convenient. Especially when you travel between larger cities. Because of their size, the train stations can sometimes feel intimidating to navigate. But once you understand the system, it's all quite straightforward. We travel back to central China to visit Wuhan a city that will forever be linked to the global pandemic that changed our world so abruptly. I visited Wuhan twice before this all started and met a sprawling city with massive bridges spanning the Yangtze River busy shopping streets, but also some charismatic old neighborhoods. Wuhan is actually a combination of three formerly independent cities that have grown into one huge metropolis. Its history is often compared to Shanghai with its concession era buildings and commercial energy, but the city also has its own distinct character. One of the most iconic buildings here is the Yellow Crane Tower, from where you can see much of the city skyline. And also the historic Wuhan Yangtze River Bridge. This double deck road and rail bridge was the first modern bridge to span the Yangtze River and was completed in 1957.
finish this journey through urban China in Guangzhou, a fascinating city located in the Pearl River Delta. It's a center for Cantonese culture and has grown into a major trading and business hub over the years. While skyscrapers dominate the skyline, Guangzhou also has a variety of neighborhoods with a more relaxed atmosphere. Downtown Guangzhou is filled with modern office towers, shopping malls and a massive football stadium and is really the commercial heart of the city. But as you make your way through town, you'll also meet the other faces of Guangzhou. The pedestrian-only Xiamian Island, for instance, is filled with historic mansions and villas. Also impressive is the Sacred Heart Cathedral, while the nearby riverside promenade is perfect for an evening stroll. In the suburbs, I found this traditional South Chinese garden called Bao Mo, with temples and classic bridges. But in the evenings, when the neon lights go on, Guangzhou is unmistakably a Chinese mega city again. That concludes my journey through urban China. I realize I have only scratched the surface and you could spend months, if not years, exploring these places. Yet I still hope this video gave you some travel ideas or at least provided a glimpse into these captivating but complicated cities. Thanks for watching this video and I hope to see you again next time. Travel safely.